and Tourism Committee. It's Wednesday, November 4th. How are you, Ms. Hahn? I'm good, and we're joined. Uh, I'm Councilwoman Janice Hahn. I'm chair of this wonderful committee, joined by uh, Councilmember Tom LeBonge, and Bill Rosendahl is on his way. That's his car right there, that side. <laughs> so uh, let's hey. begin. Thank you. Item one. Under item one, the Board of Airport Commissioners submits for council approval the First Amendment to the contract with Walsh Austin Joint Venture wherein Walsh Austin currently is serving as construction manager at risk for the pre-construction phase of the Bradley Westgates project at LAX. First Amendment would constitute um, LAWA's exercise of a contract option to continue the contract for an additional five years expiring on December 31, 2014 and to engage Walsh Austin to serve as construction manager at risk for the construction phase of the same project. The CAO also has submitted a report and recommendation for approval of this um, exercise of option and First Amendment to the contract. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I, as you know, I'm Alan Rothenberg, President of the Board of Airport Commissioners, and uh, uh, proud to speak uh, today uh, in support of this item, and I'll also be talking about item number two, which is obviously related. Um, if uh, the council today uh, approves these two contractual matters. Uh, it will be an historic occasion uh, for the city of Los Angeles and for LAX uh, because it will be the final preliminary step toward constructing uh, a really new, beautiful, operational, uh, efficient uh, facility to modernize uh, LAX. Uh, as you, Council Member uh, Hahn, know, but probably better than anybody, uh, once the lawsuit between the city and uh, a collection of, of entities was settled, it opened the way toward finally doing improvements at LAX that had been long, long, long delayed. Uh, and among the things that it did is it allowed us to add gates uh, somewhere on the western side of the airport. Uh, in order to be ready to accommodate the new generation of large aircraft that were on their way here, the A380, the 787, and others. Uh, there were a number of options that were being discussed, and I think you probably were the first person who quickly said the best alternative is the gates on the west side of Bradley, and now we call the... Thank you for Bradley remembering West. it the way it Believe happened. me, I remember because you beat us over the head many times <laughs> and said, look at this. Um, and, and we obviously looked at all the alternatives but concluded that the best uh, uh, of all those alternatives was the west gates at Bradley. And it's important, and you have the books in front of you for people to understand, we're not just adding some gates on the other side of the terminal. For all intents and purposes, we're building a new terminal. We're expanding it out west. Uh, it's going to be beautiful uh, and something that uh, we're going to be very proud of, both architecturally and also in terms of its efficiency. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it, it's it's really important that the way this has come together also I exemplifies, I think, the way we're trying to operate uh, at LAWA, and that is with all our partners. The airlines have been great uh, cooperative partners in developing everything. Our neighbors are, uh, I hope, <laughs> happy with how we're doing this. Uh, and it has taken their cooperation because some of the things we've had to do to get to this point is obviously hire the architects and get it designed in there. Uh, because we're moving things west, we had to have uh, cross-field taxiways that would allow uh, passage uh, from the north to the south and vice versa, which meant uh, doing a lot of things with a number of our airline partners uh, because they had facilities in that area. And all of that's done. And if today the council approves these, this contract amendment and the second item on the agenda, uh, we will literally be ready to uh, uh, put the shovel in the ground or I guess more appropriately a jackhammer into the concrete uh, and get to work. And we will pledge that we will do it on time, on budget, uh, and uh, I, I, I will personally invite uh, the uh, Lieutenant Governor of the State of California, whoever he or she may be, uh, to come and cut the ribbon uh, when we uh, open uh, this uh, Bradley West Terminal. Great. Thank you. Um, I'll just talk a little bit okay. about what the scope is. I think President Identify Rodden yourself for the record. 
Oh, I'm Gina Marie Lindsay, Executive Director of Los Angeles World Airports. Uh, and before I dive into the scope, I do want to uh, thank a number of the other city departments that have been very supportive in getting us to this uh, point, particularly Andrea and uh, folks in the CAO's office, because we've been torturing them with uh, kind of new uh, construction delivery models and quick turnaround board reports, and we really appreciate that. Uh, what this project really is going to deliver is 15 new gates for a total of 18 gates, um, uh, most of which will accommodate new large aircraft. At, uh, on the west side of the Bradley Terminal, uh, you can see from the pictures there that there's lots of windows to celebrate the Southern California environment. Uh, there's a new Great Hall, 100,000 square feet of commercial and kind of people gathering space. This is going to become the piazza, the marketplace, the towns, town square for uh, the terminal. We've got additional baggage claim, new federal agency passenger processing space, and then we connect this all to the existing Tom Bradley International Terminal, carry the roof line out to the street, and thereby uh, create a new front door for international passengers that are arriving or departing uh, Los Angeles. Two actions, if approved, allow Walsh Austin uh, to move out of the pre-construction phase on the concourses and into the construction phase, and then approve the selection of Walsh Austin for pre-construction and construction on the core. They fielded a very strong team. Um, they've got a good track record. They've committed to 20% uh, minority and women business enterprise participation in the pre-construction phase, 14% in the construction phase. Uh, the requested contract values are not to exceed numbers, not to exceed 545,550,000 for the concourses, 584,200, 584 million, I wish it was 1,000, yeah. 200,000 uh, for the core. And just a word about this delivery methodology, the construction manager at risk delivery method um, really gives us control and flexibility. The general contractor, which is Walsh Austin, uh, works with us to determine the most efficient phasing of every part of this project. Uh, so together, we determine the best way to sequence the bids and to um, put out the construction packages. For example, it allows us to compress the schedule a bit. Um, we can put out the bid packages for the foundations and steel acquisition while we're still finalizing the design on the finishes so that we can really try to collapse a lot of the activities. Um, so total project cost, including uh, program management cost, design fees, uh, costs for other city services, including LAWA staff, is uh, anticipated to be a billion five. We'll support this through, big number. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll support this through a combination of retained earnings, airport revenue bonds, which is debt, passenger facility charges, and uh, airline rates and fees. So um, as President Rothenberg mentioned, not since 1983 has this kind of activity been going on at the airport. It's a lot of work. We're anxious to get on with it. And with your help, we will do just exactly that. It, it'll be our own uh, personal stimulus, stimulus package. package. It'll be yeah. thousands of people uh, working. And That's also, yeah, if you believe uh, the prognostication of the various economists about the time that the world is digging out of the economic uh, doldrums, we'll have a brand new spanking beautiful international terminal and I think we'll be ready to receive uh, exactly what uh, is going to take place uh, at that time. So I, it's a shame we had to wait so long, but maybe there's a blessing in having uh, delayed everything this long. We're putting people to work at the right time and we'll have a terminal ready at the right time. Right. Roger, do you want to say anything? Um, I, I'm here to just Great. Well, um, I, I just <laughs> wanted to, um, yeah, we're, it's, I think it's 18 months uh, we're here uh, after, uh, you know, I, I, we began, again, looking at that, what, what was the, uh, the, the settlement agreement, what did, was the green light projects uh, that the community agreed on, that the city agreed on, and certainly uh, that's when um, I began hearing, as I, kn I know you did as well, from the airline industry saying, what is LAX doing to accommodate that next generation of aircraft? Uh, you really need to reconfigure some of those uh, gates to, to accommodate, accommodate them, and here we are, uh, and we are uh, building uh, these gates on the west side of the Bradley Terminal, as well as, as you pointed out, a lot of other stuff. It's a fabulous plan. Um, 
let me just talk about those planes because you know uh, that was a lot of focus of what we were doing was that next generation of planes how are those planes coming are they being delivered are they uh, actually showing up uh, as we thought um, what, what's the deal with the with the A380 and the, the Dreamliner the delivery schedule is stretched out um, which frankly is okay from our standpoint because it gives us a little bit of breathing room there are three days a week that we have two A380s on the ground uh, now and we have five days where we have at least one A380 on the ground uh, we've managed to find ways to move that around the airport's still working that's a good thing um, our our anticipation is um, when when we you know brought the project forward initially and promised that we would work as fast as we could we expected to have 14 to 16 a380s a day uh, by 2012 we no longer think that's going to happen we think it's probably going to be more like 9 to 11 and probably closer to 9 and maybe even less than that I was just on the phone this morning with one of the international carriers that said no I'm not going to be there in 2011 with my a380 it's going to be 2013 so they are still coming um, but it's going to be slowed down right but at least we'll be ready when they do come and they can't ever accuse us of of not preparing or planning for that day exactly um, let me ask uh, this the idea of the work packages that you were describing mm -hmm. um, and that sounds again very efficient very transparent uh, helps you to achieve your goals on time on budget what happens if some benchmarks don't happen um, what's built in um, in terms of um, well, Roger may be able to answer that better okay. than I, but let me just identify um, generically that part of the reason project management is such a fascinating area is because nothing ever goes right. And so what you're doing on a daily basis mm -hmm. is doing workarounds of what you thought was going to happen as opposed to what is going to happen. The, um, the fact that we're doing this instead of one large bid, mm -hmm. we've actually uh, procured our general contractor, and then they have several packages to work mm -hmm. with, actually gives more flexibility for those workarounds than mm -hmm. the old style of design, bid, build. You want to add to that? Yeah. It's, uh, the liquidates, I'll, damages clause, is that? Uh, we do have a liquidated damages clause, uh, certainly, that's in there right now, that if they don't meet certain de deliverable deadlines then right. or then we do have liquidated damages and, and that includes a final delivery date when they have to meet it now you know we track every package we've got a master schedule that the program management team uses the contractor will submit their resource loaded schedule uh, that will compare to ours and we'll track it on a weekly basis where if there's any deviations from schedule we can mitigate them immediately so uh, we will be on on top of it the whole way uh, among the other things also the, the Board of Airport Commissioners approved a process for expediting approval of change orders because obviously they're going to come fast and furious and if we have to wait two weeks or a month every time uh, to get them approved it'll uh, go on forever and so we have uh, come up with something that it, again allows for transparency uh, make sure that we're being fiscally prudent but also lets us move with alacrity to approve change orders right um Alan, you mentioned, as, as I have said, that this is really LA's personal economic stimulus package. I, I think what we're doing at the airport and at the port uh, are two entities that we have control of in the city and that will produce um, you know, lots of, uh, of jobs. Uh, really, I, I think it will stimulate our economy in a way that I don't think a lot of other major cities are being able to take advantage of right now. Um, which leads me to um, my next question that you know we received a letter from the Latino Chamber of Commerce um, and and the letter actually went to the mayor um, and it they felt they, they were wanting to express um, their concern what they saw as a lack of outreach um, for the small local minority firms um, in terms of being able to access this incredible project um, are there still opportunities for them to participate? What resources, you know, do we have for them to um, participate? I understand that Walsh Austin has yet to contact out about 90% of the work. Um, again, this, this is not going to be our economic stimulus package if we don't include everybody 
uh, I hate to use the all boats rise when we're talking about the airport, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> you know that's you know that's the philosophy that I think we all want to have if we are going to invest in this kind of huge huge project. What are we doing to um, do the outreach for the, for the minority? Um, First of all, as uh, Gina Marie and, and is there still time that they can get involved? And ha how are we going to make that happen? Since the contracts haven't been approved yet, there's plenty of time. Okay. Uh, as Gina Marie indicated, uh, we have a commitment for 20% participation of minorities and DB uh, uh, businesses. Uh, I th think that uh, I'm pretty proud of what uh, we've done at LAWA over the past several years to make sure that not only do we get promises from various con contractors uh, with respect to uh, MBE, WB, DE, mm -hmm. I'll get them all right, um, but in actually delivering on those promises, and we have an active department that, that oversees that, so I am positive that we will uh, fulfill our commitment in that regard. You know, um, I mean, 20% is good, is there a chance that we can do better than that on, on this? That, that's, I mean, that's a minimum. Yeah, 20% is, is it's sort of like that, that is minimum. And, and we know that it's the small businesses that really are the backbone in terms of creating jobs for our economy. So well, we would love to get that 20% up. Yeah, so would we. The 20% okay. is really for uh, WB. Maybe we be. We, maybe we be. We got it. That's the answer. Yeah. Um, it, w regardless of size, it doesn't, and there's obviously a lot of room for smaller subcontractors right. who are not necessarily. Who's overseeing all this? Uh, I am. Okay, uh, good. Yeah, and and uh, I was a little disappointed in that letter because okay. it, it doesn't reflect what we're doing. And, okay. And I, uh, um, as Gina Marie, when Candy signs, writes yeah. a letter. We all listen. Um, I've made a personal commitment to the commission that this is not business as usual. That just having a a building on schedule and on budget if we haven't improved the opportunities and the participation of local small businesses this project won't be a success so uh, there are a number of things that we've done in fact our commitment to that success is one of the reasons we hired Walsh Austin they came in with the strongest um, minority and diversity outreach program of any team and let me give you just a couple of examples of what they've done uh, and, and to answer your first question, the, none of the subcontracts have been awarded yet, so there are, there's 90% of about a billion dollars worth of opportunity for subcontracting that's yet um, to be awarded. So there's significant opportunity. Uh, since Walsh Austin was uh, selected, they've hosted three public outreach meetings. Uh, some of them have been in combination with our Small Business and Job Center. Uh, they've spoken at numerous organizations, including the Greater Los Angeles African Chamber of Commerce, the Regional Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the National Minority Contractors Association, the National Center for American Indian Development. And over the last three months, they've conducted 19 outreach and networking meetings with a number of minority disadvantaged um, Chamber of Commerces and communities. They've convened a community council that they work together with on a routine basis in reaching out to the, to the communities represented by the council members. There's 18 members on that community council, including the Greater LA African American Chamber, the Latin Business Association, the Regional Hispa Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and the Los Angeles Minority Business Opportunity Center. And there's 14 others. Their diversity coordinator, this this month, in fact, just this month, was awarded the Contractor of the Year Award from the Regional Hispanic Have you Chamber. Have you reached out to the South Bay Latino Chamber of Commerce? Well, they've reached out across the, but not to the South Bay. La Lawa is not a member of the South Bay Latino Chamber of Commerce. Why not? Uh, because the South Bay Chamber of Commerce uh, refuses to disclose either their membership or their financial records to Lawa. So we cannot... Um, we cannot join. But you them. can still reach out to them. You don't have to be a member have, to reach do, out to we them. We reach out through the Regional Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. May I just so. suggest that you um, specifically reach out to the South Bay Certainly. Latino Chamber We'd of Commerce? We'd be happy to. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, um, you know, they, they um, many of us are associated with, with uh, you, you look at their board members, several council members are a part of this. I mean, many many of us have relationships with, okay. with this Chamber of Commerce. So, and when you looked at um, sort of who they CC'd on yes, this. They CC'd, yeah. They CC'd everybody. Everybody. So, um, I, I just think this is a good opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, 
instead of just being disappointed, uh, you know, let's be proactive. Let's reach out to, to the executive director uh, and make them a part of this, this team. I think, you know, that would be the right thing to do right now. And, we'll, and again, yeah. we're being, we're, uh, Councilwoman, we're trying to be very proactive, so we will do that. Yeah. Um, in addition to the outreach, um, we have a packaging strategy. I mean, it's one thing to reach out to somebody. It's right. another thing to reach out to somebody that can't respond. So, for example, on the uh, temporary bus gates facility, which is out on the street, uh, will be out being bid now under this contract. Uh, normally, a project of that size would be broken down into about four packages. We've broken that down into 20 packages. And the idea there is to allow participation from smaller businesses who may not be able to bond a larger package. So in yeah. addition to the outreach, yeah. we've developed a packaging strategy to try and make it easier for people uh, to participate. What's the and timing on when some of these will be awarded? Uh, we hope to go to the board with the first construction package in December. In December. Yep. Um, and you're feeling confident that by December, which is only, you know, 30 days away, uh, you will have reached out gotten participation allowed these um, maybe weebies to really fully participate and be a part of one of some of these packages as i've said absent the south bay yeah uh, hispanic or latino chamber of commerce we've reached out to um, virtually again as you said it's more than just reaching out right. yeah uh and the other thing just to kind of give you um some encouragement as well uh, Walsh Austin does have a 20% goal on their pre-construction. Uh, to date, they've achieved a 31% level of participation. So they are already exceeding um, the goals that we've established and that they promised. So uh, we're, we're, I'm very hopeful that our I, I mean, I, And I think we're going to have a lot of report backs so we can all keep on, on top of, of this fabulous project. And I think, you know, that would be one thing I would want you know particularly on on this first round of packages we'd like to see in this committee exactly what the participation would level would be of yes mr mike okay. molina mike molina external affairs i spoke with mr signs yesterday personally oh, and good. pledged the commitment that we'd be working with him. thank you that's what i wanted to hear yes mr Lebon. just to follow up on that if there's somewhere appropriate there could be a sign board that says you know stimulus LAX may have a job for you and your company, www.tomlebonge.com. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> whoever, whoever would be, okay. number one. That's number one. Number two, I think this is a tremendous report. He said there's one thing missing. Who's behind the mayor? I don't know. <laughs> okay. We so, noticed that. All right, so we'll reprint those in 8 by 10s and distribute them around. No, I'm teasing you. <laughs> I think it's tremendous because it shows the visual. And I hope as you go forward throughout where it's appropriate uh, that more people can know about this. This is very important uh, for Los Angeles. I absolutely thank you as the uh, operator of the uh, director of the airport. Fearless leader. Okay. But thank the president who is uh, in a volunteer role. It takes a quarterback and a quarterback gets in the huddle and says we're going to play the to run an airport and that's what you have focused on to run an airport to serve the public and to make it safer for everybody and as a leader in the commission you've advanced that cause so personally I want to thank you as the chair of our sister city program which knows what the international world means the only question I ask is is there an event that underneath this new Bradley terminal there could be a escalator down to a subway like they have in Heathrow like they have in uh, in Orly like they have everywhere else in the world. Where is the Green Line going into this airport? I think we don't know yet. Okay, well, you know, I'm in favor of having to go right under the building. So whatever you could do, come straight down Century Boulevard. Uh, what makes it happen is it's when it's connected as close as what I've seen in my little travels in the world. Yeah. And I just don't want to see us make a mistake that they made uh, now 20 years ago plus. So, the green line. You know, Councilman, even, it's even, if it's, even if it's elevated, you know, even mm -hmm. if you could figure out, and I know you got a lot to do, but there's something that has to be done. We, we've expressed mm -hmm. time and again our full support for bringing the green line right. into LAX. Uh, obviously, we don't have a, a vote on on that, but we are fully supportive of bringing it in. Do you have a guess? If you had a, if you had a come in there today, give me a guess. Where would you have it? I mean, if you could. Well, the, the old plans 
probably are out the window, and that was right. the last time we had a specific plan because that right. was back. But didn't you call for like a transportation uh, person Deputy, at the yeah. at, at, at yes, Lawa? Yes, we are in the middle of an options study. Right. We have several options that actually I reviewed about right. three weeks ago. We're in just the formative stages of that study. But given all the work that's going on with MTA, all the work that's going on with the airport, having bringing that together in a way that actually is viable is really important. So we are trying to figure out the options. I would be less than candid if I left you with the idea that it would be able to come in subterranean into the central terminal area. I think that's unlikely. More likely is going to be elevated. And that's okay. probably going to be someplace. Could it get to Sepulveda at least? We hope so, yeah. Okay, I think it's, it's Sepulveda. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Vaughn. And so, because oh. there's a famous song called Pico and Sepulveda, and when you get that green line to Sepulveda, there'll be a famous called Pico and Century. Okay. And, and Thank Council, you. Councilman uh, Labange, I appreciate your compliments, but mm -hmm. it brings to mind a discussion I had with a collegiate athletic director once where I talked about the fact that the coach was uh, a terrible coach but a great, great recruiter, and he said, if you can't be both, it's better to be a great recruiter so you have the talent. So forget what I oh, or the no. board is doing. Right. We have an amazing executive director we do. and senior we do. director. Gina Marie Lindsay directors. is fabulous. And you, other, you, I think we have an amazing councilwoman here who really took the step to say this is very important. So give Janice on a big hand right now. Right. Thank you, Tom Bond. Um, thank you. And, and uh, again. Mr. Rosenthal comes. I want the same for him. Yes. Um, uh, clearly, uh, this uh, is so important to um, really us being a world-class city, is having a world-class um, international airport. And I agree with Councilmember LaBange that it has to be connected to a form of public transportation that works, that's convenient, and that will get people out of their cars. And this is a golden opportunity, uh, like it was to build the gates on the backside. It is a golden opportunity to connect uh, our public transportation into... Um, now uh, we're joined by Councilmember Rosendahl. Uh, we're just uh, ooh eggs. Sorry, Gina. Uh, we're oh, just okay. we're just on item one. Um, I was just going to call for public comment. Um, didn't know if you had anything you wanted to give a shout out on one. What's that? Come on, Chad. Stop mumbling. You answered most of my questions regarding it. <laughs> it's just amazing how it works. We're very pleased. Get your Thank little you. script and you run with it. Uh, I did ask a lot of questions regarding this at the last meeting, uh, and I want to repeat that this is about modernization, yes, expansion, no. That has helped us a lot. Can you describe the timeline for issuing the construction packages? Did we answer that one? Uh, yes. Um, we, hope to, that. we hope to award the first construction package in December. Uh-huh. And when will you release the first? It, the, well, the, uh, the first construction plans are actually out on the street right now. Excellent. So we're hoping to award the first construction contract, uh, subcontract, on, in December. And when will we break ground? Uh, we hope to break ground the first week of January. Great. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Thank you. And, you know, as we uh, invest uh, billions uh, into modernizing this airport, uh, as, as you know, um, much of what I've wanted to do is also invest in the men and women who actually make this airport uh, work well for the passengers. So that's a great segue to our public comment. Um, we have some of our friends from SEIU here today to speak on item one. Um, Hayes Witt, Robin Wilson, um, Carolina Briones, and Arnold Sachs. Okay, let's do one minute. Yeah. I'll be quick. Hayes Witt from SEIU, want to uh, applaud your leadership, your leadership, Councilmember Rosendahl, Councilmember Labange, Gina Marie, uh, Director uh, or Chairman um, Rothenberg, in bringing this project to fruition. We're excited about it, supportive of it. We think it's great, and we think it's uh, equally visionary that that you have chosen to invest in the people who do the work in the building at the same time that we're modernizing the facility. Um, September 9th, Council voted to increase the living wage at the airport to cover family health care. We represent most of the workers uh, who are covered by that amendment and called their employers into bargaining immediately afterward uh, for what we thought would be routine, simple bargaining about a good thing, family health care, 
uh, with uh, money that is there. With a couple of the contractors, that's been the case, and they've uh, go ahead and finish here. They've behaved uh, or they've uh, bargained responsibly, constructively. We're not there yet, but we're going to get there. We're working on it together. Unfortunately, three of the contractors, G2, who works for American Airlines, APS, and World Service, who are primarily uh, based in the Tom Bradley Terminal, have uh, brought delay, obstruction, obfuscation to the process. It's very hard to understand h how that can be at this point, but that's where we are. And as we approach Thanksgiving and the holiday season, we're hopeful that we'll be going into it with peace and with health care and not with uh, strife and disagreement. Absolutely. Beautifully said. And you know we're 100 percent on your side. Again, if we, if we don't have uh, happy, healthy uh, workers uh, who have health care, uh, we know that it, it results in turnovers and lost uh, revenue in terms of training people. Uh, let's invest in the people. And I will tell you, every time I fly, it is the people working there that make the experience for the passengers. Nice modern, modern terminals are nice and good and important, but the passenger really d relies on a lot of the workers that you represent to make their traveling um, you know, easy and comfortable. So thank you. Either one of you, yeah. Robin. Hi, my name is Robin Wilson. I um, work for one of the contractors that Hayes spoke about, G2 Secure Staff. And like he said, they're just not getting it, and they're doing everything in their power to undermine what, you know, you guys have worked so hard and we've worked so hard to achieve. You know, they're coming in, being irresponsible, not being prepared. When we're asking them to give us, you know, their perspective on things, they're coming in like, you know, they're completely unaware of what we're doing. They come in and they say stuff like, you know, oh, well, we need you to disclose. And then when we ask them for their numbers, they say, oh, we'll be back. And they take five and six hour breaks and then come back and say, oh, do you have your stuff together? And it's like, we were waiting for you. Mm. So, I mean, it's just been yeah. really a hard road to get them to come on board and to just do the right thing. You know, the employees have fought hard. You guys have really been our champions and fought hard for us. And now here they are and they don't want to do anything about it. They want to, and then the, the stuff that they are coming up with is where they will end up having not only the savings, but they'll get to pocket a portion of the money that we work so hard to get. They want to offer us insurance that is still at a dollar twenty-five. It mm -hmm. breaks down to a dollar twenty-five an hour per person, and they want to pocket the rest of the money. Yeah. And we don't think that that's fair. Thank you. Good morning, Carolina Briones from Lane. Also here to support these projects um, to modernize the Bradley Terminal and maintain LAX's competitiveness, which we think is very important. And we also um, think uh, it's equally important that employees are trained, as you mentioned, and agree 100% with what you said. And also that we make sure we have uh, contractors with responsible business practices operating at the airport. We have been working with LAWA on a policy to address these issues and problems, but unfortunately we still see problems that are still happening at the airport. Workers continue to report a lack of training uh, for people assisting passengers with disabilities and wheelchairs in poor condition. That continues to be an issue. And also there are still irresponsible contractors operating at LAX just wanted to briefly mention one, I know time is short, that's actually operating right there in the Bradley Terminal, that's, which is a terminal you know, we're investing billions in. Uh, the name is Sirica Security. They also operate at Miami-Dade Airport. And the Inspector General of that county, Miami-Dade County, found that they had purposely underreported their revenues to the airport, to that airport, by $3 million, and had underpaid their permit fees by over $200,000. So these, the, you know, it's just an example of the kind of problems that we think there needs to be a policy to really tighten up uh, responsible contractors at the airport and uh, employee training. Thank you, Carolina. Arnold. Oh, thank you. Sorry to be such a, a downer for this conversation, but when you ask your, when your employees ask, well, why, why did we lose our health benefits in the first place? Do you tell them that city council acted to um, have these companies be able to eliminate their health care plans and give a dollar twenty-five pay raise in lieu of those health care plans? I bet no. Um, and then I heard a little bit of argument. No, that's not what happened. That's not what the living wage ordinance was about. Companies get an opportunity to eliminate health care for $1.25. That's what I've read and heard in the newspapers and here. But then I heard stories regarding the Green Line and the leadership at LAX. 25 years in the making for the Green Line to get to the airport is the number one priority. Just think if it was number two priority, where how long it would take. Um, and, and the Great building at Tom Bradley West. What about the midfield concourse? Councilman Rosendahl, you championed it. 
when you ask for the $950 million bond. And what about that bond? Because the you. airport has one, Thank you, you have very one, much. Thank you and very there's much. bonds all over. Thank so you. We've got great and leadership. I appreciate all of you coming today, really. And I appreciate you giving us an update. And we're, anything we can do um, to put pressure on them, we'll, 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 we want to do. Okay. Thank let's, you for giving us the opportunity to speak. You're very welcome. Um, is there a motion to approve item one? Yes. Second? <clears throat> okay. Uh, motion to approve uh, and seconded. Without objection, we'll uh, unanimously approve item one. Let's go quickly to item two, which is. Uh, another contract with uh, Walsh Austin for the airport. Yes, item two for council approval I'm is sure a just taking these together. contract with Walsh Austin Joint Venture to serve as construction manager at risk for both pre-construction and construction phases of the Bradley West core improvements component of the uh, Tom Bradley modernization project. Um, this is for a term expiring on December 31, 2014. The CAO has submitted a report and recommendation for approval of the contract. So this contract is for the Bradley West core improvements, uh, unlike what we just did with the with the uh, West Side gates. Just quickly, and I'm ready to approve this. <laughs> I'll move to approve it. Uh, anything you want to say about this quickly? I think we covered it. Yeah, I think so too. We probably should have just taken these items together. Any questions on this one? Just a real quick, quick one. Uh, at the last meeting, Denny Snyder um, raised the concern that the Bradley Terminal should uh, feature uh, blast glass, you know, glass that, uh, uh, any considerations for that? The blast glass would be more of a consideration if we were building right next to the roadways, yeah. but the construction of this terminal is really on the west of the already existing Bradley Terminal. Yeah. So the blast glass isn't really coming from the air side. The protection you would need would be coming from the street side. And what is our timeline for completing the central utility plant improvements? Is that work on schedule to be done before Bradley West is completed? Uh, the work is on schedule to be done before the final Bradley West is completed, yes. Very good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Last question. Is there reclaimed water being used at any of these facilities? At what? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Oh, we have uh, a public speaker on item two, Arnold Sachs. Another free shot. That's good. Thank you. Um, will there be architectural drawings and plans that we can see? I, I know that when I heard conversations regarding the original Tom Bradley um, renovations, uh, I, I believe uh, Gina Marie Lindsay said she wasn't sure how to budget for that, budget for first class and deliver coach, and she left that up to the Lawa board. But I was just wondering, um, again, these gates are taking the place of the midfield concourse. You spent hundreds of, uh, not excuse me, hundreds, millions of dollars on an architect to build a, uh, to show a building with a um, an overhead uh, access to it from a building on the east side of the, on the inside of the horseshoe. What's the status of that building? And what's the status of the the access from that building out? to the Tom Bradley and out to the midfield concourse, will that be built? What's, what's up with the money going down the drain that Lawa doesn't have to spend in the first place? Thank you very much. Like. Uh, is there a motion to approve? Yes, I move. Second? Second. Okay. We will um, unanimously approve both of those contracts, and they will be in city council today. Great. Great. Thank so you very much. That, and can I just have one ahead. moment? Uh, in the midst of Always. one of our uh, meetings last year, uh, Councilman uh, Rosendahl uh, presented me with eggs from uh, his chicken coop. That's uh, true. I brought them home. Uh, Georgina said, what's the story on these? I told him. Now Over the next weeks, home. there were uh, secret uh, telephone conversations back and forth between Georgina. I will admit that's true. And Councilman Rosendahl, the result of which we have a chicken coop in our backyard. <laughs> we, we went and bought some baby chicks, incubated them. They are now laying eggs, and uh, awesome? I think that this is... Oh! Who's got a camera? Who's got a camera? Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Very exciting. Uh, very exciting. Well, I'll mix them in with mine and see how they taste. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank these, you. Are these your, like, grandchildren or something? I mean, you know. Regards to your lovely wife. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let's, we uh, go on to item three. Yes. 
Item 3, um, the Board of Airport Commissioners submits for approval a consolidated master lease with Castle and Cook Aviation Services for premises at Van Nuys Airport for a term of 30 years and approval also of specified <coughs> findings and adoption of the negative declaration that the proposed project to redevelop the site as a fixed base operation could not have a significant effect on the environment. The CAO has submitted a report and recommendation for approval. Okay, quickly, what are we doing here? Um, Steve Martin, Chief Operating Officer of LAWA. Um, we are consolidating a series of small leases at Van Nuys into one master lease in order to facilitate an investment of over $10 million in a new hangar and related facilities. And it's pretty straightforward. It's basically consolidating leases they already have, but basically they had to do that in order to uh, facilitate the investment. Good. Uh, anything further? Okay, there was some, you know, there were some um, concerns uh, by one of the other tenants uh, about yep. the ability of them to um, operate as an FBO. Um, have those issues been resolved in this new lease? Yes, those issues get resolved because of this new lease. Okay, uh, and how have they been resolved? Well, the long-standing dispute about fueling rights and non-fueling rights among right. people at the airport, this okay. resolves it in a way that says Castle and Cook, the party involved here, will have all the lease premises required by the minimum standards in order to be a fully uh, approved FBO. And I think the other FBOs are satisfied with that. Okay. Um, and how long was it going to take to redevelop this site? Um, I think it's a two-year project. It's three years, three and years. they have penalties if they have any delays. Okay. Now there's going to be construction going on. and Yes, demolition. And uh, do, how's the, the neighbors? Are they aware um, of this? Have they been notified? <coughs> um, um, it went through both a neighborhood council vote and was supported by the neighborhood council. There was an initial study done to make the CEQA determination, and all of that was disclosed in the environmental research that was done. And what will be sort of set up in the three years during the construction for any issues that may come up with um, the neighbors? I don't, I don't know. I'd, I'd leave that to Castle and Cook to answer in terms of how they're managing the construction. Okay. Um, Can we get sure. just, because it's always nice to get <laughs> approval and everybody's happy, and then there's three years, there could be some challenges. Steve, um, and always like for someone to be on the other end of the phone if, if yeah. someone calls with issues. Steve Friedman with Castle and Cook Aviation. Um, as part of the initial study that Steve mentioned, we are committing to putting up 10-foot uh, construction walls during construction. We have reached out to the neighborhood, and we will as we approach those noisy periods of time where you may have some demolition and trucks coming and going in the morning to um, uh, deliver concrete and that sort of thing. So we are prepared to uh, reach out to the neighborhood and prepare them for all of those events. Okay, and if people have issues, who are they supposed to call? Well, they would contact us, and okay. we would work closely, of course, with the airport and okay. uh, the local Van Nuys staff. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, very quick one. Yes. Um, what do you is Castle and Cook plan for the space? What are you going to do? We're essentially demolishing two old obsolete hangars and erecting a new 40,000-square-foot hangar with an office building component that will service and facilitate the uh, corporate jet and private jet GA crowded Van Nuys Airport. We've been doing this for 29 years, <coughs> and um, as um, some of you know, Mr. Murdoch has actually built hangars in four different decades now, <laughs> and so uh, this is sort of business as usual for us. Very good. Uh, will the Castle and Cook hangars include an FIS to process flights from out of the country? FIS, help me out with that acronym. Uh, Federal Inspection Services, uh, Customs and Immigration. I don't, I don't think they have that in that facility, and I don't think uh, CBP, the Border Protection uh, part of Homeland Security, I don't think they staff Van Nuys as an international arrival currently. Uh, but are there planes coming and going from here and there that might need that? Um, there that? is there is uncertain demand as to how many um, international flights would arrive at Van Nuys Airport, and so uh, CBP hasn't staffed it. That means that when planes come into the country, they have to go to a different airport before going to Van Nuys. Uh -huh. um, so Could you look into that? Just sure. get back to us, because yeah. it is the first place of entry to the states, and, and maybe that, that is something you should consider from a convenience standpoint. Just for the record, can you please explain the environmental process that was followed? Uh, does the city attorney agree with the findings of the initial study negative declaration? Um, the environmental process, I think back in November, I think it was, or January, <coughs> we required that Castle and Cook do what's called an initial study to uh, see what part of CEQA was triggered by what they did, and the initial study 
allowed us to make a determination or recommendation to the board that a, a mitigated negative declaration could be done and uh, city attorney endorsed that finding okay yep. very good thank you thank you well, i just on the issue there that mr rosendahl brought up whatever it is safety and security is most important uh all other things are then in line because whether it's i don't want to see people flying in from uh, around the world unless they go through a very strict uh, customs and uh, situation which is at LAX or mm -hmm. wherever else that may be wherever you suggest it may be but I don't know if I want to make it so convenient to be flying into the Van Nuys yeah it's so. basically a determination by uh, a federal, federal agency right. about where do they f where, where are the options now well it depends on where they're coming from but I'm, I think most of them stop at commercial airports because that's the, that's where those tend to be well, would they stop at LAX San Francisco yeah, LAX San LAX. Francisco LAX. Seattle Seattle yeah. something yeah. like that Okay, good. okay, thank you very much. You. Um, we have one public comment on this item, thank Arnold you. Sachs. Would you give us a report back and give us some numbers on that? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, there was a story in the newspaper, I believe it was a couple months ago, regarding a fuel, um, a problem with a fuel depot at, at Van Nuys between Castle and Cook and um, Murdoch. And I understand that the, there was a settlement reach, which means money changed hands. But I believe part of the problem was that Murdoch said that Castleman Cook didn't meet the requirements to operate a fuel depot there. And I was wondering, have they, has that ever been looked into? Has that been uh, authorized or vetted like we had with the scenario at the uh, LA Live situation? Is that just vetted because it was years and years and years in the making or been going on for that long? Or are they being required to meet the requirements that allow them to operate as a fuel depot at Van Nuys Airport? What's the status on that? Thank you very much. Is there a motion to approve this item? So moved. Second? Um, yeah, thank you. Just for the public comment, why don't you write a letter, Mr. Uh, Sachs, to the administrator at the airport because I'm not going to get you that answer. You just ask the question. Why don't you, if you're really interested, write a letter to the administrator, copy us, and you should get an answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, has it been seconded? Yeah. Chair Hahn, I would just yeah. like to clarify that you're being asked to approve the mass, the 30-year lease, right. and you're being asked to make findings and adopt the negative declaration. Okay. Thank you. So it's been moved and seconded to do just that. Uh, so that will be a unanimous vote on that item. In the interest of time, I'm going to go straight to item 7, uh, since we have a lot of people here on that item today. So those of you who weren't prepared to have it happen right now, it's under, happening. Under, under, and I've got uh, public comment cards that I will call up. Uh, uh, why don't you... Well, wait, why don't you, you guys wait. Um, yeah, okay. Under item 7, motion Han Koretz, introduced on October 21, proposes that the Harbor Department report to this committee on the upcoming second phase of the clean truck program when a broader number of older trucks will be prohibited from operating at the port unless retrofitted for reduced air emissions, and that the department provide an update on the information that truck drivers should have in order to comply with the requirements of the clean truck program. Actually, I think I would like to have the public comment first so you can hear some of their concerns. And colleagues, I, I brought this motion because I was hearing from many truck drivers who are concerned that the next deadline in the clean trucks program, uh, they're worried that they're not going to be able to comply and they fear uh, that many drivers are going to lose their jobs come January uh, because they won't be able to meet some of the requirements and so they are uh, want to hear what their options are, uh, what grants are available, what programs are, are available, and I think some of them are um, also wanting to know whether biodiesel uh, is going to be an acceptable um, alternative um, as part of the clean trucks program. So why don't we hear from them first, and then you guys can um, answer their concerns. So here's who I have um, that have come all the way down here to speak. Uh, William uh, Stahl, is that right? Uh, Julio Cardoza, um, Christopher Pine, Noreen McClendon, and David uh, Viegas. If there's uh, not enough chairs, you can wait, and after one, one person speaks, 
and then um, John, just make sure you know you listen to these and, and um, address that in your comments. Okay. Good morning. My name is David Viegas, and I'm with the Green Port Drivers Association. I'm here representing the five estimated five to six thousand truck drivers that will be losing their jobs uh, this uh, December 15th over the Clean Air Act that was established. Um, our drivers, uh, they they feel that this program has been uh, streamlined. Um, they oftentimes they only have 10 days to respond to a grant or, or, or a, a retrofit. So um, we're estimated five to 6,000 drivers will be out of work because they're not up to par with uh, the regulations. So um, we've, we've uh, also uh, established a program as an alternative also um, with biodiesel. And um, the great, great uh, thing about this biodiesel is that it, it reduces the main uh, cancer-causing pollutant, which is the uh, particulate matter. So um, currently, we're, we're fueling with vert biodiesel. Um, and uh, they come out, and we fuel up our trucks every Friday. So um, that's, that I'm bringing to the table. And I also have uh, proof here um, as to what, it, what this biodiesel does for, for um, the engine. Now, now I just want to make it clear that it's not the truck causing, uh, causing the cancer, it's the fuel. Right. You know, it's the product. Right. Okay. So, um, you know, like we had uh, China shipping us stuff with lead. You know, immediately we did something over that because uh, the repercussions to the generations, you know, it's long term. So if, if we uh, find an alternative to that fuel, I think that's the greatest thing that can happen right. to the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. <laughs> Hi. Good morning. Uh, members of the committee, um, I know each of you, um, and you know I'm always trying to help out the community. Um, I got involved with the Port yeah, Drivers. The My name is Noreen McClendon. I'm the Executive Director of Concerned Citizens of South Central Los Angeles. Thank you. Um, and um, I initially got involved with folks at the port trying to find jobs for the gang community, right. um, which is a nexus here. Um, so in any event, um, I'm concerned because uh, the trucks that, have already, that are already outdated, those drivers trying to get retrofits are having to take leases with um, employers who they may work for a full week, and by the time they deduct their lease payments, the gas, and all these other fees, they may wind up with only $200 for a full week of work. Um, Plus, they're spending 16, 18 hours away from their families and in their trucks just trying to make that little bit of money. And I think it's unfair. And I also think that they do have some proof that the biodiesel is actually reducing the emissions. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is a way that we can, if we just shorten or give them more time, do a study to see what the biodiesel does, that we can avoid un making 6,000 people unemployed and do something good for the um, – also, we can reduce our – dependence on foreign oil right. and do something good for the environment. Thank you, Noreen. Oh, my name is Julio Cardoza. I'm a, a, a vocational training school. You know, uh, I'm a national trainee trainer truck for automotive truck, not truck driver, for trucks, you know, have to service the trucks. Oh. And we are to, I'm here to support them. And also to, uh, we are ready to uh, support and to uh, train the drivers and train the mechanics to how to service, you know, the trucks uh, by changing from diesel to biodiesel, which is not necessarily be to expend a lot of money or a retrofitting cost a thousand dollars just to be in compliant, just by a minimal, uh, eventually in the period of a year, example, it can be changed some hoses on some trucks, you know, I mean, because it could be affected eventually. But it's not a really big concern that costs a lot of money to them. And that we are a school, we support them, you know, and we are ready to train them, you know, to how to use it. And also, we got to hear that... Uh, a proposal, you know, that we presented even to commissioners, a uh, Port of Long Beach commissioner, which is one of them, has been in our meetings. So he heard a word about it, and he's uh, he probably will have a next meeting with the AQND to bring that issue also. So we yeah. are okay. find the different sources of how to bring this issue to Thank you. to benefit. And I want to present you all the Sorry. documentation, okay. you know, Great. to explain and the proposal Great. that awesome. we're putting. Great. Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is William Stark. Uh, I represent Vert Biodiesel. Uh, we supply biodiesel to anywhere in Southern California, to trucking companies, um, to biodiesel co-ops that use it for, to have, we'll talk about that. Um, plain and simple, biodiesel is not the magic answer 
to everything, but it does have a lot of positive effects by using it, lowering emissions, so on and so forth. There's only one emission is NOx that is addressed that everyone kind of focuses on. Um, there are things in the near future, there are different things that can be added, additives to, to biodiesel to f reduce the NOx. Um, but every other aspect of it, biodiesel reduces emissions, particulate matters, with no modifications whatsoever. Uh, what Julio was talking about is biodiesel acts as a solvent, and it does have a tendency to, to rubber fuel lines. It will, you know, wear them out, and that's the most expensive repair that would need it. So any, any current diesel truck can use biodiesel? Correct. No retrofitting? No modification. No. And is no. biodiesel readily available? Yes, it is. Is there enough for everybody that wants it? Not, no, no, there isn't. And that is uh, being addressed. Uh, there are plants that are coming online in the near future. Um, but let's face it, I mean, diesel is very widely used. And right now, your understanding is that the port doesn't allow that as? They have not approved biodiesel because the only thing that they focus on is the NOx issue. Okay. They don't look at particulate matter. They don't look okay. at any, which is all part of their thing. And all we're asking for is, is time right. to do a proper study right. to prove that right. biodiesel is a mainstream okay. fuel. Okay, good. Yes. Hi. My name, thank you for having us this morning. You're welcome. Uh, my name is Chris Pine. I'm on the board of directors of the Biodiesel Co-op of Los Angeles, uh, which is a consumers group which also advocates and promotes the use of biodiesel. A couple of things I'd like to point out is biodiesel is already being used for economic reasons. Um, by many municipalities for their in their fleet uses for transition because you don't have to change the all the vehicles and the and the back of house repair you just have to change the fuel which is essentially um, by writ most of them use a, a, what's called B20 a 20 percent combination of fuel which has been approved by AQMD for fleet use if it's a properly uh, a proper b blend of of the two fuels mm -hmm. um, uh, and we are just here in support of this activity as as a transition because we realize that by 2012 these the laudable goals of the clean uh, 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 truck initiative are are, are are to be put in place but it is a hardship when you have to have to replace this much capital equipment in this short a period of time especially with the independent truckers and we feel that the the city hasn't strongly supported enough uh, initiatives that would help them, such as the, uh, the transitional use of biodiesel. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all for coming down. I appreciate your testimony, and I, I, this is probably the first of uh, many of these hearings that we're probably going to have on this issue. Let's have the port staff come back up. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you very much for coming down. Okay. Good Hi. morning. Good morning. Um, John Holmes, Director of Operations, and I have with me Chris Cannon, who's the uh, tr truck program manager. Okay, good. He's the, he's the guy that's responsible right. for implementing all the truck. Okay, programs. you've heard these concerns. We've got another deadline coming up. You know, um, there's a claim that, you know, maybe 5,000 uh, truckers will be out of a job, uh, but wouldn't be if, uh, if we... Uh, sort of either extended the deadline or um, had an opportunity to approve this biodiesel. So and I, I think the first thing that I have to, uh, I, I, I suspect I'm not going to be very popular today, but I think the first thing I have to say is uh, people attribute the deadline to the port, but actually the deadline we're talking about is a CARB deadline. As you know, in the initial phases of the clean truck program, we got out in front of CARB on this because we wanted to get rid of some of the older trucks. We are now in complete alignment with the CARB guidelines. So even if the port decided that they would, uh, you know, for example, embrace, say that an older truck with ro burning biodiesel is the same as a, right. say a newer truck burning right. diesel, we could not uh we couldn't embrace that because the deadline we're effectively enforcing on 31 december is the carb deadline so the the you know i'm not trying to push this off on somebody right. else but we depend on carb 
to do the studies and analysis and tell us what is equivalent to what. And are so they doing a study right now? They, d they are doing studies on biodiesel, and, and Chris can probably speak more to it. He's an environmental uh, uh, engineer. Uh, but the things that I don't dispute anything that you're, you're, the gentlemen have said, but the reality is biodiesel uh, does, there, there are less particulates as I understand it, but it does increase the NOx on the, uh, which is one of the things that of course we're trying to get rid of. And the second issue is uh, because of the nature of biodiesel, some of the truck, trucking companies uh, have a hard time, it, it voids the warranty because it, it, it does have certain effects on the, the trucks. But the reality is, if CARB studied this problem and said, you know what, port, we think that, uh, I'm just using numbers, a, a 2,000 and th and, or 2,000 truck burning biodiesel is as clean as a 2004 truck, which obviously won't, is one of the trucks that won't be, uh, will still be allowed in on, on 1 January of next year. Uh, I think the port, we support CARB's effort because obviously we don't have the staff to do all the analysis. Right. And we support CARB's efforts on the retrofit. If CARB tells us that the retrofit is a good retrofit, we accept the retrofit. So at this point, uh, you know, I appreciate very much that, you know, you're concerned about this and we, uh, but the reality is the, the people that we would collectively have to go to right. would be CARB. Is there an opportunity for us to do that? I right think, now, I, I think we could go to CARB and ask, and and uh, but um, is there is there an opportunity? Yeah. I think the best thing to do at initial phase would be uh, for us to go to CARB and maybe uh, brief you and your staff on what the what what kind of analysis and what kind of projects they're working on, and see what the realm. Would there be would there be um, um, an opportunity maybe for um, like our staff, your staff, maybe someone who's representing the biodiesel, maybe have a meeting with CARB all together so we kind of... Absolutely. I think that's Absolutely. what I would recommend that we do, you know, obviously sooner than later, I, I, uh, just so we can all kind of sit around the same table and hear the same information together and see if there is an openness for any kind of dialogue on, on, on the deadline and on the... the um, progress of these studies and we and we've had and we would probably have to include aqmd obviously, that's fine but is there way is, could uh, we, we have had uh, we have cons constant meetings with them uh i think could we have for, a meeting though just a, focused on yes. this issue yes if you could help set that up you know set soon. It up okay good very soon that's indeed. what i would like to have happen and, and you know again we would have to get the people that absolutely work on this right. rather than right. the people who are implementing right. the requirements right. but, cl but clearly i would like to see a representative from this group that came today to sit at the table just to no so question can, okay good question and i'm i'm not going to tell you good. i'm an expert on biodiesel we're, we're just trying to our goal right is reducing emissions as right. you know and if we right. can do that and, and, and we all people, want that and we have been 100 percent behind you know uh, clean airports clean ports but it obviously it uh really hurts to hear that there might be uh, you know something like 5,000 people out of, out of uh, work as a result of this I, I always think um, you know we've got a balance and I've always said we can have good jobs and we can have clean air I, that's my m mantra I don't think it should be one or the other but it's feeling like this time around it might be we can only have clean air and we're gonna lose jobs and I don't think any of us are prepared to embrace that concept right now during this economy so I would agree and I think it's better to do it sooner than later because right. as it stands there was uh, we were fortunate enough to get probably more carb money than we expected and they they went out with an initial solicitation and they might come out with a another solicitation so I think okay. the people that are in jeopardy of maybe losing their trucks we could then, if we if we knew what the answer was, right. we could determine whether we're going right. to pursue the right. sort of the uh, route where you, it's a determined equivalent, or the route where they we have to help them into new right. equipment or right. So I would say like the next week, we can do that. <laughs> you could work you. with uh, Jenny yeah, and my staff that. and work with this group. But, right. Uh, before I, uh, Chris, do you have anything to add? Because you're the, uh, I'm just the operation. That's manager. really what I wanted to accomplish here. No, that's Good. fine. It's oh, so we're, we're, okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, great. So uh, w uh, with that, uh, my recommendation will be that we, we set up a meeting quickly. And if I may add one other suggestion, maybe I, I was on your website uh, last evening and I thought maybe we could, because uh, we have a lot of truck information on your, our website, we could put a link Perfect. from your Perfect. website. Perfect. So if you have a truck question, because we have a clean truck center that Perfect. facilitates Right. I just thought maybe it would be nice to have a, a link on your website as Perfect. well. Perfect. Link up. Are you okay with I'm that? A, I mean, we're friends. <laughs> I, would, I would like to think so. Is that so. what that is? <laughs> have you befriended me? Okay, absolutely. Link up. Let me up. just ask a question. Of the 5,000 truckers affected, how many of them online in their business that will be able to use that access? All of them are online? Not all, but a lot of them. A lot of them. A significant amount. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let's do this. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Noreen. Okay, thank you very much I, again. Uh, let, let's, there's always seems to be people falling through the cracks. This seems like a huge one. Let's try to figure out how to solve it. Okay. And you've, John, you've been Mr. Problem Solver in this whole Clean Trucks program. And I, let's figure this one out. Okay. Okay, I, uh, in interest of time, let's, um, I was going to approve item four and item six. Do you guys have any objections? Four and six? Yeah. Okay, without objection. You have cards. Oh, thank you. Um, item four, we have Arnold Sachs. And six also. And six, we have Dr. Clyde Williams. You two want to come on up? Arnold and Dr. Williams on item four and six. And then we'll approve those items. Number six. Yeah, um, Both of them. Yeah, we'll do I don't that. want to yeah. speak on board. No, yeah, you're, you're on item six, yeah, you're on item yeah. four. Let's take four first, Dr. Uh, Arnold item Sachs. Four. Um, call, federal Dr. regulatory issues and, and litigation matters at Los Angeles International Airport. I believe, uh, Supervi uh, Supervisor, Councilman Rosendahl, you did, Rosendahl. you did give me an answer regarding one of the $950 million bonds that the airport issued, and you stated that those bonds issued by the airport are under FAA um, government regulations. But you never really answered about the $950 million bond that the city first issued when they discussed the original, when you had the item originally in city council chambers and, and you first proposed the expansion and the, um, and the work done at Lawa, and you said it was a good, the modernization, exactly. The $3 billion project that was going to be the largest in the city's history. And that was a $950 million bond. The airport floated a $950 million bond. There was just a story about a $700 million bond that was held, a $700, $700 million bond that was held up because of some discrepancy with the leadership. Thank you very much. But federal regulations, oh, you're so quick, Ms. Hong. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. Uh, Dr. Very Clyde much. Williams. Very simple. These organizations that are asking for an extension of their time are professional. They knew the terms of the contracts. They knew the schedules. This is not rocket science. If it was state-of-the-art something, it would be okay. But let the teeth of the contract be used. If you don't enforce the specifications, you have no specifications, so I would highly recommend that you not give them the extension. Thank you. Thank you for your insight and perspective. Okay, after hearing that, colleagues, uh, can I get a motion? So moved, second. We'll approve items four and six. Let's go to five. Under item five, the Board of Airport Commissioners submits for approval an amended and restated airline terminal facilities lease with United Airlines for passenger terminal space in Terminal 7 and 8 at LAX. It's up to you. Um, it's what, um, okay, Do, uh, on item five, is there a time limit on that? Bill was suggesting that we continue it. The oh, last date for Council Action, 1125? No, 1125. Right. Yeah, but the last day for Council Action is not until 1125. Well, um, this is part of a settlement agreement with United Airlines, and we have a court hearing on the 10th next week, so it would be preferable if... I don't mind if we put okay. it out, but we bring it to full council and we can discuss it. Okay. Very good. I move it forward to council. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now let's go to eight. We'll ask our questions. Okay. Okay. 
Under item 8, motion Rosendahl Hahn introduced on October 27 proposes that council ask LAWA to report to this committee on a plan for fully implementing the runway status light system at all runway intersections at LAX and to report on current staffing levels at the LAX control tower. Madam Chair, Gina yes. Marie Lindsay, Executive Director, LA World Airports. I'll make it quick. Um, the plan for implementation of the runway status lights is being hammered out between chief pilots of the airlines, air traffic control uh, folks of FAA, the safety and standards folks of FAA, and LAWA. Um, we do have some money left over in the MOA that, that um, facilitated the Im implementation of the current system. We think within about six months we'll be able to apply that uh, several hundred thousand dollars to a couple of more intersections, but again the priority needs to be agreed to by all the entities I just identified. Um, after that, we're going to need to figure out a funding strategy with the FAA. You'll recall that the airport put up its own money to do the first phase of this, $7 million. We're um, working hard with FAA to put up uh, significantly more of their own money to help us do this. So short answer is we'll have several more intersections done in the next six months. It'll probably take us a year to a year and a half to get the rest of them done. Very good. Very good. A couple of quick questions. Thank you very sure. much for, for that update. First of all, the air traffic controllers as a group uh, were not in the room when the decision was made for the existing runway status lights. Is that true? I don't know the answer to that. I know air traffic control as a section of the FAA was involved. I do not know whether the local air traffic controllers were part of that group or not. If we could ask them to come up, I'd love to hear from them as well. The air traffic control, Mike Foote. Um, I really appreciate the, the time frame. I asked the FAA to show up. They're not here. It would be nice if they showed up on the local level because we are the ones where the rubber hits the road. So if you could let them know, this Eon Gregor guy, that the next time we do this, I want him here. And if he won't come, we'll go to Washington and make him come. I'll it's do that. It's important that they show up. Well, I think I just, and I appreciate that, Mr. Rosendahl, but the federal government sometimes doesn't. I don't care. I got that, but I think if you say it, in a, I'll help you. All right, okay. good. Help Thanks. us. Fine. Um, could you state your name for the record and tell us your thoughts on both the runway status lights and the staffing of the tower? Okay. My, yeah, my name is Mike Foote. I'm the uh, union president for the air traffic controllers at Los Angeles Tower. Oh. Um, no, we were not in the room. In fact, we, we tried very hard to get into the room, but it, uh, it wasn't it wasn't Lawa that that was the obstacle. It was the FAA that was the obstacle. For the record. Right. Okay. That's story one. Story two. Um, now you heard Miss Lindsay say that they want you in the room going forward. Uh, we'd love to be there. Uh, okay, great. Uh, the second question is, uh, when you looked at where they put the runway status light so far, did it mitigate some of the uh, safety issues or, or not? Well, from our, from our opinion, you know, you've got to prioritize, as, as was stated, where you're going to put these things. I mean, we want them everywhere. We want them everywhere, just for the record. You know, we want, we want them everywhere. But if you're going to prioritize on the south side in particular, this last one we encouraged we had was that taxiway Mike, um, which is one of the high speed. We, but basically what, what we were being told by the FAA is because they changed the geometry of the airport that this type of runway incursion simply couldn't happen. We, we told them they were wrong then and, and proof uh, from their very close runway incursion uh, a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. shows that uh, we were right. Um, but going forward from here, I mean, uh, putting them down a taxiway uh, at the end of the runway, um, down at Uniform, for instance, uh, you could cross down there and probably not hit anything. I mean, that's not really in the impact zone. Mike, Papa, and Tango are where, we, where you're going to stand a chance of actually getting hit. Taxway Golf, you would get hit if you were crossing. Um, the, the ends of the runway were not a focus so much for us uh, in this particular case, if, if you're prioritizing. So for us, it would be, it would be uh, Papa, probably Tango, Mike in that order. Okay, what I'd like you to do is report back to the committee where you think the priority should be for okay. the record in writing so that we know that and we can... Uh, Give it to Miss Lindsay, who also with you can sit with the. But FAA. you said ultimately you'd like to have them everywhere. Yes. And are we pri prioritizing because of cost? Well, we have to prioritize because um, if we were to wait to just do it all at once, we have a bunch of infrastructure, electrical infrastructure that has to go in, so it would slow things down. So we're leaning forward to try to do as much as we can as soon. But as ultimately, we can. you will have it every every intersection. That's the goal. That's the goal. So okay. prioritizing just means. Which what, ones can which, we get done soonest? I see. Because we, we had a runaway incursion a day after the, the one on the south side, uh, yeah. over on the north side. And it, would be, it would be in a spot that you would think probably the odds of getting hit are, are slimmer, but still could have possibly been prevented by that. 
by having the runway status lights there. Okay, my next question to you is the tower. How many certified uh, tower folks do we have and how many should we have? And what is the overtime issue like for those that are certified? Uh, right now we're 35 certified controllers, although we do have one that's downstairs. He might he, He's eligible to retire. He hasn't been working for a while. So we might be – we'll go with 35, actually, in the building that are certified to work right now. Um, in the past, 47 would be the number that we need to open up all the positions for as long as the FAA wants to open the positions. Uh, traffic count doesn't necessarily matter. If you want to open up this helicopter position or this ground control position, you need the body to open it. So um, that's what where we're at. What about the overtime? Uh, Six-day work weeks. I, I, have, I got out of mine this week. I have a six-day work week every week, but I got out of one this week. I got someone that didn't have one to work for me, but that's the only way I get out of it. In your professional opinion, overtime, which is a potential fatigue yes. issue, you're sitting there, you're watching these planes come and go, is not a, a good safety measure? No, it is not. They, we, we should have the bodies so that we do not need to constantly work six-day work weeks simply to open the positions. The what FAA do we need to do we need to, to get open. up to the 47 that we know must be there? <sighs> well, uh, well, we got, a new, we got a new contract, which is a big help for us. Uh, before that, it was, I would have said it was impossible. Um, now with a new contract, we're actually able to get – because what we couldn't do before is get a controller from, from Van Nuys or from, from uh, Burbank to come to L.A. because they take a pay cut. So that problem has been resolved. Um, be that as it may, we're still getting people off the street coming to Los Angeles, and, you know, and, we're, and we haven't had any certified. You, can, you know, they're counting trainees as controllers. They're not controllers. Right. We're washing them out. So yeah, we, we got to we have to resolve that problem by getting experienced people into the position, and we'll get them certified. And, we'll, and what do we need probably take to, a year. I'm an elected official. What can I do, if anything, or Miss Gina Marie Lindsay do to speed this up so we can one day say we have 47 certified folks in the town? You know, honestly, I don't I don't know what LAWA what tools you have available to, to say what what it is that you could do. Uh, you, you know, you could we need to incentivize people to come to Los Angeles and, and to stay. Um, we have people that are that are scheduled to leave. I have somebody that's going to be, become a supervisor in January. He's a controller now. They're going to become a supervisor over at Burbank. You know, I mean, <laughs> put pressure me, on them to stop. What, what yeah, let me just, just let me just ask on that the latest um, near uh, yeah co co um, collision that <clears throat> almost happened. Uh, what was the makeup of the tower at at that point? Uh, I think we were probably maybe one body short in the in the uh, on the on the shift. But the positions that were that were so should have been open were open. Um, were there trainees up there or they weren't involved. veterans or they weren't involved? It, it happened. Uh, uh, a very good air traffic controller working the position. Uh, I'm not sure if he's working six day work weeks. I was sitting next to him. I, I've been working. You know, I don't know how much what he worked the six day work week that week. But um, basically, what happened was as the aircraft was exiting the run, he read back hold short runway two five right, which is the requirement. Uh, that's that's our job. He did that. We got the response for that. And what happened after that, there's, a, there's an alert that took place on the radar scope. So there's two aircraft that are converging on the radar. Not really a factor, but our, our rules require us to give the exchange traffic to these two aircraft. Say, hey, do you see this guy? Do you see that guy? And then we come back. As you're turning back to the position, the alarm goes off from the ASDX, which is the ground radar. And, and uh, fortunately, at this point, the guy was already stopped because he saw it. The 7-5 was about taxiway golf, too, too fast to stop. Not fast enough to get in the air, and if he'd have kept going, he'd have he'd have hit him. And he, we, our contention is, if we had the the runway status lights there, the big red light would have been. That would have been. Yeah, this guy was disoriented. He honestly right. thought he was on two five left for some reason. I don't know. Is there anything else we should be doing in terms of technology besides status lights that um, would would improve safety? Yeah, I don't have it. I don't see anything on the horizon. I don't. You know, I'm, that's not uh, something I'd be privy to. I, I, we like this, this runway status lights. Our only issue with them at all, really, is where they're at. Okay. When can we get more? Right. And uh, right. that we don't know when they're out. Right. Well, I definitely think, you know, can't tell if they're, you should be working. involved in the, in the, in the discussions on, on prioritizing, I would believe. Uh, just to think if the president of the commission, the director of the airport, Madam Chair, maybe 90 days from now we can have a meeting on a, like a Thursday morning out at the airport tour some things, invite some people there, invite the congressional delegation representatives who fly in there every, you know, Thursday night and Friday just to get the relationship going. It's all about relationship. So if we have a Thursday morning, they won't be there. Yeah, 
Well, well, they're they're flying well, I don't think I don't think the Congress people will come. Oh, okay. But I think their deputies will come. Okay. Thank you. That's my thought. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank anything you. else on this uh, item? I just want to say, first of all, thank you, Gina Marie Lindsay, for your leadership. It's been incredibly good. And I want to thank you, Mike Foote, for your leadership in the tower. I am not happy uh, with the fact that we don't have 47 uh, certified air traffic controllers. I've been on this council for four years. We've been fighting, and we're still nowhere, number one. Number two, I want a, a much more clearer prioritization of where the next set go. And if we need to get our congressional delegation to, you know, I get so angry because the FAA is just a bunch of bureaucrats. You know, they report to the members of the House and to the administration. And instead of them playing big shot, the elected officials are the ones who need to know we have potential safety issues with the tower and potential safety issues with the runway status light. So I would like a letter that would go to Maxine Waters, Jane Harmon, uh, and, and um, Dave Rohrbacher, uh, um, and whoever else is a member of the House, uh, maybe um, the lady that's on that oversight committee there. Um, her name is escaping me, the one that owns a lot of houses. Laura Richardson. Laura Richardson. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't meant to be a fun. I just couldn't get her name. But that much we know is an issue. Uh, Humor's good. All right, the four or five of them that relate to the airport, I want an official letter asking two questions. One, how can we staff that tower? What do we need to do to get certified 47? And two, uh, how can we accelerate? the runway status lights, and do it in such a way that the prioritization of the tower folks is taken into consideration. I would like to see that, and then I'd like a report back on that when you think it's appropriate to get that kind of action. Okay. I'm more than happy We're to done. call those electeds and do whatever I need to do. Okay, thank you. We, we need to wrap this up. Day. Got it. Duly noted. Um, we got Denny Schneider uh, on the queue, and then we, we've got to adjourn. Because we're late. On behalf, I, I'm here to support and thank you for all you're doing. That's it. <laughs> you stayed for the whole meeting to say that. Thank you, Denny. It's okay. Um, I'll get back with you. Later. We're receiving and filing this, but we've made a lot of uh, recommendations and um, concerns that were expressed here. And we would we like to report back yeah. in January. Yes, let's get a report back in January. By Gina. the way, I do want to mention that those incursions that did occur had nothing to do with geometry. Okay. Yeah. Good point. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, seeing uh, no, f we will receive and file that. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Let's get down to council. Sorry to get a little angry there, but yeah, I, no, I got to get the message yeah. out. You have a right to